I want to talk about success today. Everyone wants to be a success, but um, you have to do it with intentionality because success is never an accident. It just doesn't happen. Oh, wow, I was successful. I didn't even try. Well, no, you had to have tried in order to be successful. And I'm, I'm going to go through a, a couple different areas of life where you want to be successful, where you can be successful, and uh, what uh, steps are necessary in that success. So um, I guess the first would be marriage. When you get, when you get married, you, you get down on one knee and you propose. That's the beginning of this. And um, whether you got down on one knee or not, you're not going to get married unless you propose. Nick's getting married in what, a couple weeks. Right? Did you get down on one knee? Tell me you did. You did? Well, what a renaissance, man. Way to go. Yeah. So, so to be successful in marriage, I mean, it starts with Will you marry me, right? And then you have that engagement period where you learn to find out a little bit more about each other. You become um, exclusive to each other, getting to know you, period of time. And uh, that connection between the two of you deepens and you learn a few more things. Uh, Someone once said, if you want to know what your spouse really is like, lock them in a room uh, with their iPhone and slow internet. And you'll find out their, their behavior uh, towards things in life that don't go their way. And then, and then comes the honeymoon, right? The big wedding day and, and um, throwing the, the rice and the bird seed and going on that little vacation. Cheryl and I, we went to uh, uh, Branson area. We went down to Table Rock. You may have gone to some exotic place or uh, the Holiday Inn. Who knows? But you had that... You had that that, that honeymoon phase um, where you, you began your life together and you thought that's what life was really like, but then the honeymoon ended, right? And you've got kids and you don't know what to do and you get frustrated. Next slide. What? So this is what it looks like after the honeymoon. What? This is, this is, this is, this is how this works, Right? All right, so now it's time to have kids. So now we have the prego one, like Hannah, singing winded, <laughs> carrying her fourth child. So you say, okay, let's have, let's have kids. And, and so that journey begins. And then uh, you have that child, and maybe you were blessed to have grandma come and, and be with you for a week or two and, and help you adjust to what that was like, and then 18 years of learning and growing. And someone says, well, we're going to have a child. I always, I always remind them, listen, it's going to be 18 years before you're free again <laughs> if you want to have children. And so there's some good successes. You have some headaches, and then eventually they move out. Praise the Lord, they move out, <laughs> Right? That huge expense. They, they, they move on and maybe they start their own family, but you load them up and you send them and there may be some tears there, but it's a good thing. And that's how you have a successful children. And then if you want to be successful in college, you, you choose a school. And some people take a lot of time in choosing a school. Hannah took some time in choosing a school. We visited some schools. And then you arrive for freshman orientation week you have some fun, you learn how to do some things. You work on relationships with fellow students, connecting with staff. But then comes the work of being successful in college. I mean, picking a school is no, no, no problem. You know, orientation week, who doesn't like a pizza party? But now the work of it comes, like the work of a marriage or the work of uh, having children. I mean, the first couple, I mean, some people are long on start and short on finish, finish. You know what I'm talking about? There comes the time when you've got to buckle down and you've got to get up for that 8 o'clock class on Sunday morning or on Monday morning, right? 8 o'clock, I had a 7 o'clock class on Monday morning my senior year in, in my undergraduate work. Tough, tough. After I had been pastoring, because I was pastoring my senior year, two hours away from the school, I didn't get home till midnight and had a 7 o'clock class the next morning. So that's the four years of classes and tests and finals and senior projects and thesis or whatever it is. A lot of work. But then what happens? Commencement. You get to go on. And you either go back to school again and you start the process over again, or you go on and do what? Get a job. So there's 
a successful way to go to college, or a successful way to have kids, or a successful way to have marriage, successful ways to get a job. You gotta apply. Most people don't walk up to you and tap you on the shoulder and say, come to work for me. You gotta get out, you gotta you know, beat the bushes as they say, and get hired. And they say, come on in. <clears throat> We're gonna have an orientation. I remember when I first started working for McDonald's, they sat you back in a room and they plugged a VHS tape into a big old deck and they slapped that thing down. They told you when to wear your uniform and how to wear your name tag and how to wear your hat and how you had to be there and what kind of crew meals you got, blah, 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 a little bit of time. And then they, then they just put you out there and they, you start flipping burgers. And you learn how to do that. And you get better and better and better and eventually uh, you uh, learn your job. Then you hope for a job promotion and uh, away you go, more responsibility. Processes are everywhere, even in your hobbies. I decided to be a scuba diver many years ago, so I got this book right there, Scuba Diving. That was my book. And uh, right away, you go to class, and you become familiar with the equipment, the instructors, and you play, pay close attention because your life literally depends on Hey, what does this button do? <laughs> that could, you know, drive you to the surface like a balloon full of air and pop your lungs like an inner tube tire, or it could drop you to the bottom of the ocean if it fills with water. So all, all those things and your instructor and, and having faith in your instructor, knowing, knowing those people. And then you have your class. You have your classes, lots of classes. And you start out simple. You start out in a pool and where you can stand up if things go wrong, but eventually you have your checkout dives and you check out in some deep water, and then you have open water checkout dives where you have to either go to a lake or you go to the ocean to do your checkout dives. I did my checkout dives down in Table Rock. It was very, very cold water. Uh, I, think, I think Ryan did his checkout dives in Mexico. That was tough. Um, but you, you have your checkout dives, and then once you get certified... They cut you loose. I've dove in um, uh, caves. That's, that's me, and that's not Photoshopped. <laughs> I was young and dumb <laughs> and decided I would go swim with some sharks. That sounds like fun. Um, but uh, success is not an accident. If I hadn't, uh, if I decided I was to go do this, um, that probably would have turned out as successful as it did. One that didn't turn out very successful for me was flight lessons. I decided I was going to be a pilot. I had a person kind of encourage me to become a pilot, and um, that's a very long and a very funny story. But we decided to take up flying together. He was going to buy a plane and, and all that. So you go and you become familiar with the plane and the instruments and airspace and laws, and then you start taking tests. And then you take book tests, and then you go up in the airplane. And... Um, I think my flight class started like at six o'clock in the morning out here at, at SPI. And, and I, I wanna say, I mean, I, I didn't do very well on my, on my, I got C's. I was happy that I got C's, you know? And so I was happy I was gonna learn to fly and all that and, and uh, taking my tests and so forth. And I came home one day to Cheryl. I said, Cheryl, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I'm gonna be a pilot. And, you know, if you wanna go to Des Moines and Minneapolis, we just, Ran a plane, boom, we could be there in the day. It should be lots of fun. She informed me. She said, I'm not flying with you. <laughs> I said, why, why am I busting a hump? I'm up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm taking these tests. She goes, you're only getting C's. I don't fly with C pilots. <laughs> she goes, you got to get A's. So, so I wasn't of a mind to get A's, so I dropped out of flying. I never finished my... Uh, Never finished my, my pilot's license. I never got the license. Although I'm thoroughly convinced I could still fly. <laughs> uh, a couple years ago, I got my ham radio license. That was a lot of fun. You make the decision to get, get into the, the hobby. You get to know the guys. And you take classes. You take tests. And then you pass the FCC test and they give you a piece of paper and they say, there you go. There's a license to your radio station. You're, you're a mobile licensed radio station. You're a ham radio operator, amateur radio uh, license. Go ahead. And you just jump off in the deep end and you start doing it. Success is never an accident. Peculiar. How about professional sports like football? You hope to be drafted and then one day you get drafted. Oh my gosh, I'm in the NFL. That's fantastic. Well, what do you do? Well, you show up to uh, uh, camp, 
You get there, you have your, oh, this is how this works. This is where the, the uh, not the dressing rooms, the locker rooms. And, the, you know, this is the stadium. You get orientated to the, to the players and the coaches. And then comes what? Training camp. It's, it, oh, you were a Heisman Trophy winner, but you start all over again. And you go to this camp. And in this camp, you learn how the Tampa Bay Buccaneers play football. Oh, I know how to play football. Well, you don't know how the Tampa Bay Buccaneers play football. Well, I know how to play football. I, play, you know, I was a Heisman Trophy winner. I played for the University of Michigan. That's great, but that's not, how, that's not how the Chicago Bears... Well, let's try somebody else. That's not... Ouch, that yeah, hurt. Sorry. I stepped on my own toe there. You know, but you understand that just because you know how to play football, you still have to go to training camp. You have to learn how, how they, they play camp. And so you learn all the plays, lots and lots of books full of plays. And then comes the season and you're off to the races and you win or lose based on your skill and your talent. Well, that's success. And it's not accidental. And the same happened with the 12 disciples. Jesus called the 12 disciples. They had to be called. He said, hey, you. You over there with the nets, come here. I want you to be with me. Then they had to decide whether or not to do that. Then they spent three, three years with Jesus. We often think Jesus was just, you know, moving from one instructional scenario to another when in fact probably most of the day was just hanging out with these guys, having lunch, having fun, cutting up, swimming in the river, finding something to eat. Telling jokes. If, by the way, if Jesus, in your mind, if Jesus doesn't tell jokes, he's probably not the real Jesus. Yeah. Right? Because Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. And so, so they were called, and they were called to spend time with him. But then there was also times of teaching. He sat them down and was hands-on training, taught them the gospel, instructed them in how to teach, how to preach, how to lay hands on the sick. In Luke chapter uh, uh, 9, we're not going to go there, but this is an interesting su succession of, of things that happen in the disciples' life. In Luke chapter 9, he called the 12. You can check it out. And then he trained them, sent them out. They came back, gave a report, and they argued amongst themselves because they were considering someone better than someone else, and we tried this, we tried casting out demons, didn't work. So Jesus could have just shut the whole thing down. You bunch of stupid, you numbskulls, what? I spent three and a half years with you guys, this is what I get? This is the level of competence that I have after? No, he was so thrilled that they went, and they did it in the very next chapter, in Luke chapter 10, he called 72. And he got the 72 together and he sent them out two by two. He said, don't take a purse, don't worry about it. Shake the dust from your feet if they don't welcome you. Go, out and go into the valleys, go into the mountains, go preach the gospel to the people. Come on back and tell me how it went. So he called 12 people in chapter nine and chapter 10, he sent 72 more. And then what's really interesting, at the end of those 72 coming back, they were sitting down in a circle. They were uh, still getting instruction from him on what to do. And they said, oh, would you teach us how to pray? And then you have the Lord's Prayer in Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 9, 12 people. Luke chapter 10, 72. Luke chapter 11, you have the Lord's Prayer being taught. He didn't even teach them the Lord's Prayer before he sent them out. You know the excuse that you have why you can't go out and witness, you can't share your faith? Well, I don't have enough education. I haven't been taught enough. I haven't. Listen, if you have a relationship with Jesus, you have all you need to know. He's instructed the twelve. All right, so here's the process. He, he called them, he spent some time with them, then he instructed them, and then after that, at the very end of his life, he's, he's ascending into heaven, he says, now, here's the deal. All of you, go into the world and preach the gospel. In Mark chapter 16, he sent them out, saying, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. So this is my main point. My main point is this, that success is not an accident. Success comes in a process, and it's important to understand that process, that it repeats itself over and over again in your life, in every area of your life. If you want to be successful, that's the process. I'm afraid the modern church oftentimes is producing a bunch of passionate people that have empty heads. And 
they say they love Jesus, but they don't know him very well. And so they have, there's been an interdiction in this process in their life of becoming a successful Christian. That's what I'm talking about. Being successful as a Christian and this process that it takes. Because no one becomes a successful Christian by accident. No one becomes a good husband by accident. No one becomes a good parent by accident. No one becomes the valedictorian by accident. You get a letter in the mail, congratulations, you're the valedictorian. Oh, I didn't even, wasn't even trying. <laughs> Doesn't happen that way. A business owner, not by accident. NFL player, not by accident. Scuba diver, pilot, a good disciple. Anything like that never happens by accident. Jonathan Edwards, uh, a 16th century preacher in America, born in Connecticut, you may be familiar with his most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Jonathan Edwards was a Puritan revival preacher back in the day, and uh, he made this comment that rings true for us. He says that a true faithful Christian does not make holy living an accidental thing. It is his great concern. As the business of the soldier is to fight, so the business of the Christian is to be like Christ. To excel at anything is process because success is no accident. Now, I've covered the steps. We've gone over them, each of those four steps in detail. Watch this. You want to be in the army. What do you do? You go sign up for the army. They tell you all the great things that the army can do. Some of them are lies. <laughs> or, or you're going to go, you know, Private Benjamin. Remember that movie? Or whatever, you're, you're going to go, you know, you have breakfast in bed every day. Well, no, you're not. You know, so you sign up, you sign up. Then they send you where? Off to boot camp. Well, I want to be, be a fighter pilot. Well, that's great. Get through boot camp. Get through this introduction. Get through this orientation. Get connected to us as the military, as the army. And then we're going to send you off to flight school. And you're going to learn how to fly uh, airplanes. We have a friend that's a, a F something, F some number pilot. Uh, actually has flown um, safety, the security detail for the President of the United States. He's one of those fighter jets that sits off the wing of Air Force One. We know him. Probably shouldn't say his name. So, <laughs> but we know that guy. And this is, this is the process. Signed up, went to boot camp, went off to school to be a pilot, and then boom, go do your stuff. Or in some difficult situations, you go off to war. You get your commission and you, off you go. As the business of the soldier is to fight, so the business of the Christian is to be like Christ. How does that happen? Well, the process that I've enunciated probably 10 times already sounds like this. You're going to make a decision to do what it is that you want to do. Then you're going to step in closer. There's going to be an orientation. There's going to be a connection process, whether it's that first week of school, whether it's boot camp, or whether it's honeymoon. So you make a decision, you get connected, and then you get some teachings beyond the warm fuzzies of orientation week. Then there's going to be tests. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be hard times, but at the end of all of that, you get to go do it. You get to swim in the ocean. You get to be on the ham radio. You get to be the, the employee at that business. You get to start your business. Why? Because you stuck to the process. So you and me, uh, it may be unfamiliar in the world that you've come from, but in this place, we have a process to be a successful Christian. And that shouldn't scare anybody. That shouldn't offend anybody. That should actually go, wow, they've actually thought that through. They're just not here on a Sunday morning to get happy and clappy and have empty brains and love a Jesus they don't know a whole lot about. They're actually going to dig down deep, and they're going to help me. I'm going to make a decision to do it. I'm going to get connected, and then I'm going to grow up. I'm going to learn some stuff. I'm going to get, and I'm going to learn how, well, I've been Bless God, I've been saved for 50 years. I don't need any of that, any of that hogwash stuff like you got. You're talking all that other stuff. Hey, listen, the Buccaneers don't play like the Packers do, right? So what I'm trying to say is that's how they did church wherever you came from, right? I'm not talking about unscriptural things. I'm just talking about this is the playbook that we have. This is how we do it. And the reason we do it like this is because we think it's the best. 
I'm not offering you second best. If I had a better plan, do you think I would hide it from you? Oh, let's not tell them that one. That's way too good. That's way too good a plan. No, this is the best plan over decades of doing this that we've discovered is the way to produce successful Christians, right? I want to produce generals. Listen, right? Doesn't the, the church has got a lot of potato peelers and we need potato peelers, but I want to turn out colonels. I want to turn out sergeants. I want to turn out people that can lead platoons. I'd rather have 300 people that are ready, battle ready Christians than 3,000 that go, that just cower in terror if there's a demonic presence in the room. Listen, the demons should shudder when you walk in the room, not when, not the other way around. Oh, I can't go there. That place is too dark. It's too dark that I'm perfect to go there because I bring the light of Jesus with me wherever I go. I'm not scared of that. What mentality is that? That's the mentality of a colonel. That's the mentality of a general, of a major. That's somebody that's had some war and its experiences, won a few battles, lost a few battles, but is well-trained and has somebody behind them to back them up. Because some people just have gone. They, just, just, they, they weren't sent, they just went. Do you know the difference? Being commissioned, I'm a commissioned officer in the armor of God. I've been sent by destiny. I've been sent by five, I've been sent there is, there is a pack of y'all behind me when we go do that. And that's how you should feel when you step out, that I'm right there behind you, maybe not physically, but you went through the process. You said, okay, I'm gonna buckle down. I'm gonna be a part of that group. I'm gonna pay the sacrifice. Orientation was fun. That was ooey gooey, but now comes time to learn a few things. And the reason that that's so important to us is because once you do that and you graduate what we call growth track, which is the third step in this maturing process, then I know what you know. And you know that I know what you know. <laughs> and then there becomes this, this thing between us. You read that, I wrote it. And we both know that these are the expectations of a successful Christian. That's why when somebody graduates uh, growth track, maybe I didn't go on the encounter they went on. Maybe I didn't teach them in growth track, but they graduated growth track. Then I know you know the playbook. That's all. So it looks like this. Live, connect, grow, and go. Live, connect, grow, and go. You make the decision to live, to be born again. You step in closer. That's connection, being connected. That primarily happens on encounter weekend. Because right now, you don't know 100% of the people's names around you, probably. Because growth happens in circles, not in, in lines, not in rows. Connectivity happens in circles, not in rows. Connectivity happens in circles, not in rows, right? I mean, we, in Western culture, it's very, very lecture-oriented to have you all in rows facing this way. But there's no prescription of that in the, in the Bible, what they did is they met in people's houses, right? I don't think everyone's furniture in the living room is stacked up in rows with one chair up front. No, because we're gonna get connected. And so we, we, with intentionality, set aside a couple days where you turn off your phone. I'm not talking about connected to your, to your mama and the internet or whatever. I'm talking about connected to God, connected to other people. It's like when your kid goes to camp, <clears throat> When your kid goes to camp, they spent a week with a bunch of kids they didn't know, but at the end of the week, what? Oh, I know all, I'm gonna miss Tommy so bad. I'm gonna love Lisa, she's gonna love him hard. And, and they, they, become, they become in tune with these people. They learn these people, they know who they are. Well, that's what happens to us as adults. We just kind of missed out. So we just put away our phones for a couple days. We sit down in circles and we talk and we, and we, and we get connected. So uh, that really shouldn't scare anybody. In John chapter 2, excuse me, John chapter 15, where we're talking about get connected, it says, greater love has no man than this, and he would lay down his life for his friends. I mean, the reason that those disciples would lay down their life for Jesus was not because he taught them, but because he hung out with them. Amen. He wasn't just a teacher, he was their friend. So, encounter. The mystery, ah, that is encounter. Why are they so secretive about encounter? That sounds sinister. They want to get me there and do things to me, and, and I don't know what would happen there. And 
that makes me feel uncomfortable. Well, I would submit to you oftentimes being uncomfortable is not a bad thing because it's in those places that you grow. But I want you to imagine that uh, I've gotten you a gift. I have a gift for you. It's awesome. It's a lot of investment, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of heart went into this gift, getting this gift for you. And now you're building with anticipation. Now you have anticipation. Ooh, I want to open that gift. I want, I want to know what's in there. And you start taking the gift apart. But before you can get the gift apart, I ruin the surprise and I tell you what I got you. Exactly. There's something inside of you that gets deflated just a little bit. Because it was like, oh, okay, now I know it's a, it's a thing, it's a thing. You know, this is how encounter is. We spend a lot of time, a lot of energy making a beautiful package that we call encounter and we want to give it to you. But we want to, don't want to tell you what it is before you open it. On the, when you first get there, you're going to do this. Then we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to break for dinner. And we just give you, listen, I talked with a pastor just last week. He's from almost three hours away. He's going to be coming, him and his wife are going to be coming to this encounter. And, I, and, I, and you won't know everybody that's on encounter. And he won't introduce himself as a pastor. And I told him, you can't even tell people that you're a pastor on this encounter. And I don't want you to come as a, well, should we try this? Should we? I said, you come for yourself. Listen, I'll give you all the information, Pastor so-and-so. I'll give you all the teachings. You can use it all. You can erase our name at the top. You can do whatever you want. It's not proprietary unto me. We just want to see the kingdom increase. But here's the deal. Here's the only caveat. You come like everybody else. You don't know what's about to happen. That's what we do. I, I told a pastor, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you what's in it. I just want you to have the thrill of opening it yourself. So listen, there's nothing weird about it. There's nothing scary about it. There's nothing like, oh my gosh, that's anti-biblical. None of that, just take a deep breath. It's just like a retreat. It's a fun, in-depth, great getting to know one another, getting to know God. You're encountering yourself, really, which we rarely have in our society to do anymore, where we just encounter ourselves. You encounter the cross, and then you take that cross with you, encounter God. You encounter yourself, you encounter the cross, and then you encounter the Lord. And that, if you do that, you'll be changed. Well, I don't want to be changed. Well, you stick in the mud, you old, <laughs> nasty, dried up Christian. If God is who he says he is, isn't there more than what you have? Well, yeah, I've been walking in the faith for 30 years, brother. I don't need any more. You dirty, old, nasty Christian, you. You Pharisee, you. I feel uncomfortable. He's pressuring me. I'm not pressuring you. If you feel uncomfortable, that's the Holy Spirit convicting you of your self-righteousness. That's what that is. If you've never felt that before, that's called self-righteousness. There's more. We simply offer that. So we say, listen, the only caveat to go on encounter is you got to go through step one. What is that? To live, to be born again. Give your life to Jesus. Because we don't want to take a bunch of people on encounter that we're trying to explain salvation to. Right? So we actually have a class called pre-encounter that you come to the week before that even though you circled saved, yes, I'm saved, we just make sure you are saved and not fooling everybody. That's all. Gosh, it's not sinister. We actually care about you. We want to make sure that you're right with God. And then we say, here's the process to be a NFL player, to be a successful parent, to be a successful husband, to be a successful business owner, to be successful in your hobby, you sign up, you get oriented, and then you buckle down and you start taking the classes. And the classes are not weird. They're not unusual. They're designed to take somebody who knows absolutely nothing about the Bible, take somebody who is clueless about the Bible and bring them all the way through a revelation of the Ten Commandments and prayer and, and all the basic things you need to, to function as a soldier in the army of God. You just need to know these things. Otherwise, you're going to be easy pickings for the devil. You'll convince yourself that you're saved and you're having to get saved every week because you're not strong in the faith. And then you just go to encounter every encounter and encounter and you go to mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop. I'm asking some of you been on an encounter three or four times. When are you going to do growth track? 
You can have your mountaintop experience all you want. They're great. Encounters are awesome. But when are you going to get down and dirty and learn this stuff? Okay, anyway, that's a little harsh. I got to admit, that's probably a little harsh. But you didn't come not to get the truth, right? You came to get the truth. That's what I'm trying to do, right? So we have this gift called encounter. We're not going to open it for you and explain it all to you. You're just going to have to say, okay, I like Destiny Church. I like what they do here. People seem to be on fire for Jesus. We're going to step out and give it a try. If you don't like it, listen to me. 100%. I'll guarantee your money back. There's a money back guarantee on Encounter. If you go on Encounter, was it 50 bucks? Yeah. 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 That just covers materials. You go on Encounter and you thought, this, this sucks, this is terrible. I, would, I wouldn't even recommend anybody come to this. I'll give your money back. You just have to come to me and tell me you didn't like it. And we'll have a little chat as to why you didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, right? I mean, you, if you want your money back for your bad Big Mac, you're gonna have to talk to the manager. Because little Susie behind the counter ain't going to give you your your, your $4 back. You have to talk to the manager, right? So I'll come up and say, what didn't you like about Encounter? I'm open to learn. And if you still didn't like it, I'll give your $50 back. 100%, not 90%, not 85%, 100% guarantee I'll give you every dollar back to you. No questions asked. So what's not to lose? And then you go, to growth, and you go to growth track. You just can't go to growth track without having gone on an encounter. Why? Because it's a process. It's a process. <laughs> like baking a cake. Put in all the elements. There it is on the counter. You haven't put it in the oven, but you can say of where it is. Oh, that's perfect. It's not a perfect cake, but it's perfect where it's supposed to be at that moment in time. So now you put the cake in the oven. You open it up. It's starting to rise. You can say, oh, that's perfect. It's not perfect because it isn't out, it isn't icing, it isn't ready to eat. But there is, there, there is a sense of satisfaction with each of these. When you come, you get saved, yes. Well, what is there to do after you get saved? This was my question to my pastor 30 some odd years ago. I said, this is great, awesome. Now what? Then I, there's what? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, what is that? I didn't know there was such a thing. What is that? He gave me a book to read, talked to me about it. It's, it the book was called uh, They Shall Speak with Other Tongues. Last guy, the guy's last name is Cheryl, spelled S-H-E-R-Y-L, I believe. He was a uh, reporter. I'm down the rabbit hole, so just stay with me a second. He was a reporter for Reader's Digest back in the day. Remember Reader's Digest? And he went out to disprove speaking in tongues. He wasn't a believer. But he went out to disprove it and only found proof after proof after proof after proof that it was real. And then he got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now the book, that's what the book is about. So he gave me that book and, and he says, check this out. And boom, you know, this, so there's more. All right, then I got filled with the Holy Ghost in my pickup truck, in my Ford F-100, driving down the Interstate 74. Didn't lose my mind. You don't lose your mind. You don't lose your mind. You get out of your mind, but you don't lose your mind. So I go back to my pastor. Okay, that's great. Now what? Well, come to Sunday school class. I'm on it. There, setting up chairs. I'm in it to win it. I want. I want. To, if this is, if I'm selling my life out to this, I want everything that you're supposed to get out of this. If I'm giving my whole life to this, it's just not this side fling over here. My Christianity is not my side hustle. I'm in it to win it. So then I go to him after a while. I said, listen, you know, this is great, you know, but I mean, how many times can we talk about, you know, David and Goliath? I got that. What else is there? And he said, well, you ever thought about, you know, Bible school, going off to Bible school? And then Matthew 11 burned on the page of the Bible for me. Verse 29, take my, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Next verse. Take my yoke upon you and what? I thought I was a Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost was just going to give me all the, just give me all the information. No, you actually have, if you want to recall to memory the things that you've studied, you must first actually study them. I wish the Lord would give me the right words to say. Well, you haven't been read your Bible in the last three weeks. You haven't done a serious Bible study in the last month. You haven't cracked your Bible for more than just a devotional for the last six months. So what you're doing is you're plateauing. Well, some would say coasting. 
But the thing about coasting is you slow down and you don't even really realize you're slowing down. You know when you pedaled your bike and you started to coast? It's good. You're slowing down and the world's continuing to move. The Holy Spirit continues to move even when you're coasting. So it's important to keep in step with the Spirit and do what God wants you to do. And you have to ask yourself, what is it that God wants me to do? And if you can't answer that, we are here to help you find your destiny. Your destiny is what you do during those 80 some odd years, should the Lord bless you, what you do with your life. That's your destiny. Your destination is heaven. If you love God, your destination is heaven, boom. But you're, what am I here to do? What am I in life to accomplish? I'm gonna be a husband, I'm gonna be a father, I'm gonna be a great employer or a great employee. That's wonderful. But what are you gonna do with the finances of your job to further the kingdom? Here's a great, here's a great mental, here's a great mental uh, help for you. The, the finance that you get from your job is simply finance to, to finance your ministry, what, you, what you're doing for God. Well, I work at the food shelf every week. Great, keep doing that. Wonderful. Um, I go out in the street with, uh, with Levi once a month. Fantastic, keep doing that. This is all ministry. Well, I'm a plumber. Then plumb for Jesus. That's what Brian Cook's done for us for the last whatever here, here at, uh, at the church. What Jake has done for us just this past week of Rick Ray, thanks man, coming in, doing, I mean, probably a couple thousand dollars worth of stuff, blessing the church, we're buying the parts, whatever. He's going, yeah, I can do that. Boom, comes in, and ladies, you have no more drippy faucets, and every toilet works in this place because somebody used their gift for the kingdom. See, this is what this is about. So, so there's a process. There's a process to having, the, having been sent. And so that's where we're gonna finish up. So you grow. That happens on growth track. That happens on uh, Wednesday nights here at the church. So if you wanna do that, if you, if you started before and you dropped out, you can start back in where you, dropped, where you left out. We're not here to punish you. And by the way, you say, well, I don't, I don't read very well. We've graduated people from growth track that cannot read. We are not here to eliminate you. We are here to help you. Our goal is not to make this hard on you. Our goal is to grow you up and help you. So we'll read you the books. We'll get them to audio books on tape or whatever, and we'll help you. So there's no excuse. You make that decision. You step in closer. You get the teachings. You pass the test. And then what? Then he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel. That's the go. The live, connect, grow, and go. It's not, it's not proprietary to us. That's how the world works. In everything you want to be a success in, you live, connect, grow, and go. You, get, you figure out what it is that you want to do. You say, you sign up. I'll put my name on the line. That's me. I want to go in the military. They say, very good. Let's go to boot camp. Figure it out. This is our connection period. Then we're going to put you in school, and then we're going to send you out on the field. Live, connect, grow, and go. It works in the church too, trust me. And if you've never had any pastor stand up and tell you something that simple, shame on them, honestly. Because you should have a well laid out plan as to how it is you're gonna go to the next level in your faith and your pastor should be a part of helping you do that. That's why I'm here. And that makes some people uncomfortable. Not everybody liked General Patton. Maybe I shouldn't liken myself under General Patton. Uh, not everybody likes their commanding officer. But at the end of the day, you're thankful you learned what you learned because when that bullet came, it didn't hit you, right? So that's where we're at. That's where we're at. That's what we're on the cusp of. That's why we're taking time out of every service to bring a testimony up here. If you came to uh, Stacy, where's Stacy? You came to Stacy's Celebration of Life service yesterday here at the church. Beautiful tribute to Kevin, her, her recently parted husband into heaven, who's now watching us smile, part of the great cloud of witnesses. What a testimony in his life encounter was. Changed his life and made such a radical difference in your family. Changed your family tree forever. And so... Uh, if you're feeling pressure to go on encounter, mission accomplished. <laughs> That's all. And I don't get anything out of it. I just want you to succeed. I want you to be part of Gideon's 300. That'll just, what? Demons? Well, come on, we got this. Let's do it. And you stand with a bunch of other people with their arms interlocked. 
my wife likes to say when you stand with other soldiers, uh, in, a, in an old time metaphor with when they were wearing armor, you can hear their armor clinking with yours. She loves that metaphor. And so that, that's what I want for us, that we hear that rattle when, uh, when the situation arises. And after this encounter, what we wanna do in this neighborhood and the differences we wanna make in our community, it's gonna be life changing. Not just for them, but for you too. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. So stand with me this morning, would you please? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you picked those 12 disciples and they stuck with you for those three and a half years. And because of your relationship with them and what you poured into them, we stand here today. Each one of us is here today because of one of those disciples. Didn't give up, but pressed on. And that may be you for your family because your kids are watching you, sir. Kids are watching you, ma'am. Mom, you don't know, but you're raising warriors. Help them to be a, help them to be a colonel. It takes work to be a colonel. It takes work to be a, an officer in the military. world turns out so many potato peelers raise a general raise a major somebody that knows the authority of the scripture in their life and the power of the Holy Spirit Father stir us as a church for this community for this city to make a difference to be salt and light give us strength give us determination Let us live for you, be connected, grow, and then go into the harvest wherever you lead us to use the gifts and talents you've given us for your glory. If you've never given your life to God, this is that moment right now. Just raise your hand to heaven and say, Father, here I am. I surrender my life to you. Right now, I want to live for you. That's the very first step. the only thing you can contribute to your salvation is the very sin that necessitates your salvation. It is only by the grace of God that we come. Hand lifted high, here I am. May I live in you, become alive. We confess our sins. We are broken and we are a wretch without you. But by your grace, we now take what little faith we have, even the size of a mustard seed, and put it into your hand and say, God, here I am. Use me. God says, I will. So Father, then connect us, grow us, and send us so that we might be pleasing and bring a smile to your face. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 